and chairman NAACP board. Um. Okay. Well, this I'll ask afterwards. Benjamin Hooks. I just. Oh, don't bring it up. Okay, fine. I didn't think I should. No. Not with you. <laughs> no, we don't need to talk about that. <laughs> Never mind. No, 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 no. The Shelley versus Kramer case. Would you describe it, please, in in very brief detail? What it what case law? How it affected case law? Well, I think I could use one phrase: equal opportunity in housing. That's what the case was about. Mm -hmm. And it involved challenging a racial restrictive covenant. Is that something that was unique to St. Louis, or were there racial restrictive covenants uh, it being used throughout the country? Oh, all over. Mm -hmm. In fact, my understanding is that the first case involved uh, Chinese on the West Coast who were brought to this country apparently to help build the railroads. Mm -hmm. And what uh, were the, the <coughs> particulars of the Shelley versus Kramer case? Uh, as I understand it, a black family was encouraged even to purchase a home in, a, in an area that... Well, I think it started out with a family who came from Mississippi and had a big family, wanted to find a decent place to live, and went to the uh, elder of their church first, mm -hmm. who uh, was in the real estate business. And at that time, my father had listed this Shelley house because the present owner didn't care. He wanted to sell it, mm -hmm. <laughs> didn't care about the covenant. My father said, if you don't care, I don't care. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, the elder and my father got together the Shelleys took a look at the house and decided that was what they wanted, so they bought it. And the Kramer family, what is their uh, role in this? Well, as I understand it, Mrs. Kramer was the daughter of one of the persons who signed the original restrictive covenant. And you know how that worked. Mm. Explain. Well, these were agreements that were worked out among private property owners all of whom agreed that they would not sell their property to certain kinds of people, including blacks and Jews and Chinese and whatever. Mm -hmm. And then they made the covenant, what we call run with the land, so that anybody who bought that property would take it subject to the covenant. And the question arises, how can they do this? How can they get away with it? Mm -hmm. Primarily because they were private agreements. And the provisions of the 14th Amendment apply to state action. This was not state action. This was a group of private people who decided to do this. So there was no way to reach them, presumably. Mm -hmm. And then the question arises, well, how did the Shelleys win? because this was a private agreement. Sure. And for a while, before the Shelleys, the court had been throwing these cases back, saying they were private agreements. You know. But the issue that made it clear was the fact that they went to court to enforce them. Why was that never an issue prior to? I don't think the issue was ever raised quite like that before for some reason. But once you invoke the action of the courts, they are state instruments. And I think that was the theory on which the Shelleys won. So the Supreme Court never declared the agreements unconstitutional. The Supreme Court in the Shelley case said, you cannot enforce them in court. The moment you come to court and try to enforce them, you're invoking state action because the courts are a part of the state structure. And the Kramer family petitioned the court to, yes. to block the sale. Mm -hmm. Well, originally, the Kramer family started out here in the St. Louis Circuit Court asking the court to enjoin the Shelleys 
from living in the house mm -hmm. because it was a violation of the covenant. And they lost in the circuit court here mm -hmm. on the grounds that, um, as I recall it, that there had been some black families in that area for generations. So it was not a covenant that covered everything. Mm. Then the Shelleys appealed to the Missouri Supreme Court. And that court reversed the lower court and ordered the Shelleys to move on the grounds that this covenant was a valid agreement and enforceable. So that was the issue. <laughs> And it was then that um, my father, knowing that the Shelleys were a modest family, they really weren't very familiar with all of this intricate stuff. Mm -hmm. So he hired and retained George Vaughn to represent them. And George Vaughn and Herman Willer, another lawyer in this city, mm -hmm. were the team that uh, put together the petition for a writ of certiorari. Sounds very interesting. Please tell me <laughs> what that means. <laughs> it is uh, an extraordinary legal remedy, mm -hmm. which you can use when you feel there's been a wrong, and you want the upper court to order the lower court to send up the record so that they can look at the whole thing. Mm -hmm. That's what certiorari is. There's certiorari, and the famous one that we know is habeas corpus. Mm -hmm. But there's also uh, a couple of others, quo warranto. These are all special kind of remedies when you can't really get anything done in the, in the regular court procedure. So that's how the Shelleys got to the U.S. Supreme Court. No one thought they were going to have certiorari granted. And then one bright May Day in, I guess this would have to be 47. 47. That's when they heard from the Supreme Court, two words, certiorari granted, <laughs> which means send up the record. And once it was reviewed? And it was reviewed by the Supreme Court, had oral argument, January 48, I think, the oral argument. Mm -hmm. And that's when George Vaughn, who was the lawyer from here, and himself a modest man, a very good lawyer, mm. opened the oral argument raised the questions about the validity of these covenants and also about the right of the court to enforce them. And of course, when the cases were actually tried, there were two other sets of cases because once certiorari was granted in St. Louis, then certiorari was granted in a Detroit case and in a case in the District of Columbia. So that the really three cases were all combined. But was it because of that St. Louis case that these others were brought to? Uh, they were all pending. At the same, simultaneously. Yeah, this, the momentum for challenging these covenants had been building across the years. Mm -hmm. There had been other cases that had been, been tried, mm -hmm. had gone up and knocked on the door. The Supreme Court would not let them in, would not grant certiorari for one reason or another. You have to go back and read some of this because some of it now that I look back was sort of technical. Hmm. But still, I have to say that probably the climate of the times was important too. Because 1948 was the year that um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted by the United Nations. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the year that um, Israel was created. And it was the beginning of the foment in, in, in Africa for freedom. President Truman was president, mm. and this case came from Missouri, and Truman was from Missouri. And there were many people who were close to President Truman who urged him to um, okay. take steps to do this. So the Solicitor General, first time I understand in the history of the country, came to the U.S. Supreme Court and advocated for the Shelleys. Oh, I didn't know that. That's true. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Senator Thomas Hennings, who was the senator from Missouri, 
was a very close friend of the president. And I have reason to believe that he urged the president to insist that the Solicitor General come on behalf of the government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And not to mention the fact that there were any number of, of what we call amicus briefs, friends of the court mm -hmm. from all over. It was a very important landmark case. Important why? Did it remove restrictive covenants or did it through, uh, what is the word, in, did it indirectly influence people to uh, change attitudes with respect to discrimination and segregation? It didn't remove restrictive covenants, but it made it clear that if you sign one, it didn't make any difference because you couldn't get it enforced in the courts. And so it opened up whole new areas where people had not been able to live before. Mm -hmm. Because if you have a, an agreement that can't be enforced, not much of an agreement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. And so areas in and around St. Louis that had been all white opened up almost overnight. Lewis Place. You remember mm -hmm. Lewis yes, Place? Yes, yes. It was a very exclusive private place. Uh, opened up almost immediately because it's on the edge of the black community. Mm -hmm. It had national impact. Now, that, that's not to say that we ended segregation. Because there were still, I understand, sections of this country where property owners got together and agreed, and none of them would move. They didn't need a court. <laughs> none of them would. They just wouldn't vacate, they leave or the they, house. Or they would not sell. They would not sell to blacks. So it, it kept. But at least in terms of having the machinery of the courts to enforce these, that, that ended in 1948. Do you think they still exist today in, in that form? Not racial where restrictive covenants. If they are, they're, they're vestiges of, of another era. I suspect that there may be some deeds here in St. Louis in some of these sections that still have the covenants in them. Mm -hmm. But they're not enforceable, so they really are sort of anachronisms. And that house is now a landmark. In, in it is indeed, and that's another story. We've just lost a very wonderful educator, Marguerite Ross Barnett, who was a political scientist, as you know. Mm -hmm. She knew all about the Shelley case before she came to be chancellor. And some of us met her at the airport when she came to take this new position. The first thing she said to us was, now I'd like to see the Shelley marker. And we all kind of ducked our heads and said, what? <laughs> Shelley versus Kramer, she said, where's the marker? She just knew we had a marker here with this famous case. And I think all of us were embarrassed that day because there was just nothing. Nobody had done anything. And I belonged to a group of very wonderful young not so young now, women here. <laughs> yeah. And I went to the next meeting and I said, you know, I've been thinking about what Marguerite Ross said to some of us. This is something St. Louis chapter of girlfriends could do. Mm -hmm. I said, we could, we could plan, organize, and implement a project which would lead to having that site designated as a historic site have a marker put on it, produce and publish a monograph which would tell the story, and then celebrate the 40th anniversary with a big meeting where we'd invite everybody to come and have an unveiling. Mm -hmm. And to my astonishment, they all agreed to do it. <laughs> <laughs> that was back in 86. Mm -hmm. it took us two years. But we did all four of those things. And on May the 1st in 1988, we unveiled the marker. It's a handsome bronze marker sitting on that house now. And there were banners on the street, mm -hmm. Shelley versus Kramer, the children all knew. In fact, one of the heartwarming experiences I had was to take a group who were here for some other conference, but they asked to see the Shelley house. So we got in a van and went over. And as we got out of the van, the kids in front said, are you looking for the Shelley house? There it is, there it is. <laughs> So it's, it's become a very important part of the history of this city now, and 
and should be. And even children are more oh, yes. aware of its significance. Yes, because there was a very wonderful program in the schools all during that year mm -hmm. where they had a rolling art exhibit and the children wrote stories about Shelley versus Kramer, what it means to be discriminated against, and mm -hmm. it was very well done. So in essence, we have here in St. Louis uh, <coughs> something that impacts or has impacted um, discrimination, housing discrimination across the country. No question about it. This particular case. Yes. Now, what happened with those other cases? You mentioned Detroit and another that was pending. Well, they were all, they were, they were combined, consolidated into one. So the decision in Shelley affected the decision in the Detroit case and in the District of Columbia case. All those restrictive covenants became unenforceable. And so it, it, it had far-reaching impact. Mm -hmm. Because from then on, this was one less tool that could be used to discriminate against people. Did your father realize what he was doing? Oh, I think he did, yes. Because my father, you know, was in the real estate business. Mm -hmm. And it was during a period in the history of St. Louis and major cities on the border uh, from mm -hmm. north to south when there were masses of black people moving north. And can you imagine what it was like to have this mass of people moving in and be restricted to a very small section of a city where they could live? Mm -hmm. They were piled up in houses, three and four families to a house. The Shelleys were one. They came and they had to live with relatives. They finally found a place to live somewhere in an area. Three rooms, five children and mother and father, you know. And it was, it was indeed um, oppressive. Mm -hmm. The other thing that occurred was that we had some excellent um, sociologists who made analysis of these cities and then documented for the for the court, the impact that this was having on the lives of people. Impact, um, which was? Um, oppressively so, because, um, you know, when you have overcrowded conditions in an area of the city that's low income and oppressed, this mm -hmm. just adds to the frustration of people mm -hmm. and to their own um, deprivation. Mm -hmm. um, it was, a, it was a very exciting period in terms of the forces that were at work trying to make the change. The NAACP, uh, the universities, Howard University particularly, um, the Real Estate Brokers Association, which was formed. This, the black real estate brokers formed an organization mm -hmm. to take this case to the Supreme Court at my father's urging, of course. <laughs> and I was just out of law school just out of law school. This was 48, I guess I finished law school in 43. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was interested, of course, in trying to learn. George Brown looked at me and said, listen, I gotta have somebody who knows what they're doing. <laughs> he didn't let you help at all? <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. But it was, at least my father had confidence in me enough to say, will you incorporate us? So I did that. Okay. Um, but there was a, it was a community effort. Herman Dreer, Dr. Herman Dreer, mm -hmm. was the chairman of the Citizens Committee. And he brought together a, an impressive group of citizens from all walk of, walks of life who became the support committee for the real estate brokers. They had fundraisers. Mm -hmm. They had um, mass meetings. It was a it was a heady time. Sure. Well, you mentioned the NAACP. You served as uh, chairman mm -hmm. of the uh, chairman of the board for the NAACP at one point. The years were what? Seventy four, seventy five to eighty four. It's almost nine years. I see. And you mm -hmm. mentioned a, a particular case that uh, well, help me with the, the name. Yeah, this was the Claiborne. Claiborne. Yeah. Claiborne. Uh, Claiborne County, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And the Claiborne County Hardware Company, I think it was, it sued us. You know, there was this a boycott case in which the merchants in Mississippi were very upset when black people began to boycott all of the businesses in town. Mm -hmm. Little town, Claiborne, in Claiborne County. 
and they filed a suit against them and the NAACP and a couple of other groups that were involved, got an injunction, and then asked for damages. They got the damages because they were interfering with their business. And the NAACP wanted to appeal, and we discovered that you had to post a bond, which was one and a half times the size of the judgment, which meant we had to post a million and a half dollar bond. <laughs> it was frightening. Um, the one thing I learned from that experience was the, the tremendous appeal that the NAACP had in this country. I have never seen mail come in from everywhere with dollar bills, ten dollar bills. And the whole, we, I said to somebody, well I think what we can do is find a thousand people in this, time, in this country who will lend us a thousand dollars. And we found them. <laughs> we found them. And raised the money. The trade unions were there to stand by. They were ready to give it to us if necessary, but we didn't have to take it from them. We raised it. Mm -hmm. Posted the bond. And then got the um, the district judge in Oxford, Mississippi, to set aside the amount. He reduced it mm -hmm. and permitted us to go up on appeal. And ultimately, we won. So you didn't need the money. So we didn't need the, the money. We got our bond money back. <laughs> and we established some new law about the use of boycotts, economic boycotts, in support of the civil rights thrust. It became... Okay.